Okay. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the session how IS3C is going to save the internet. And um, my name is Wouter Natres, and I'm the coordinator of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Standards, Security, and Safety, which runs under the IGF. And today we are going to present several tangible outcomes of our, of our process, which hopefully will also be translated into actions in the near future. Who are with me on the table? On the left side is David Huberman from ICANN, and he is uh, chair of Working Group 8, with Bastian, the vice chair, Bastian Gostings of RIPE NCC, sitting in the room. Next to David is Janice Richardson, and she's the chair of our Working Group number 2 on Education and Skills. And she's going to present uh, a next phase to IS3C and uh, a concept that we've developed uh, that hopefully will help the world further to move from the theory of, of reports to practice. Next to me is Nicolas Fiumarelli. He's the chair of Working Group 1, Security by Design of the Internet of Things. And he's going to present his report that he wrote together with a few other people on, uh, on a global comparison of policy on IoT. On my right is Martin Bottenman and he is the vice chair of our new working group on emerging technologies, and he will present the plan that we have to proceed in 2024. And at the end of the table is Mark Arvel. He's our senior policy advisor and helping me with steering this, uh, this little piece called IS3C through, the, through the, the future, basically, and helping me with a lot of good things in English because he's really perfect at that. <laughs> uh, online, we have... Stephen Tan, and he is one of the people working in an advisory panel to make what we call the list, and that's going to be a tool for governments and industry to work on the deployment of internet standards so that they're updated in time and people become more secure by design because of the deployment of these standards. And that is the rationale of this DC, to make the world more secure and safe. Also online is Abraham Selby, and he is leading our work on the uh, sustainable development goals. So he's defined how IS3C can uh, literally assist the sustainable development goals with the work that we're doing and hopefully translate them into practice. There's also Mallory Nodal. She's not present because she's flying at this moment. She's the chair of working group three on procurement and supply chain management, and I will do the, her presentation for her. And we have a working group six, but that report is not published yet by UNDESA, so we can't tell anything about it. So Louise Marie Morel leading that work on behalf of IS3C is not present because there's nothing to say at this point in time, unfortunately. So with that, I will stop and leave, give the word to Nicholas first as Chair of Working Group 3 on, oh sorry, 1 on IoT security. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Is the presentation ah, perfect? Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome for the working group one presentation on, on the, our report on IoT security. Uh, well, some of you might remember from last year's presentation where we introduced our initial findings on IoT security. Today, I am excited to present the finalized report, finally complete with our conclusions and recommendations. In a nutshell, we emphasize the importance of this comprehensive security by design approach, uh, which is paramount in ensuring the, the resilience and integrity of our increasingly interconnected ecosystem. Uh, IS3C sheds light on best practices on bolster IoT security, and this finding has vast repercussion for numerous sectors. Uh, you know, IoT devices came from smart thermostates, uh, wearable health devices, uh, smart home security systems and connected appliances, refrigerators, smart lightings, connected cars, and so on. 
So here are some graphics about uh, the, the evolution of, of the IoT for the following years, the quantity of devices worldwide, and then a regional distribution of policy documents that talk specifically about IoT security. Well, uh, our research was focused on research questions. We have five research questions. I will just summarize some of them. Uh, this helped us to, to develop the recommendations and conclusions after. So uh, we touched on, on questions about what are the responsibility of the stakeholders involved in, the, in defining the future of IoT security. Then wha what are the policy and regulatory measures uh, related to uh, crashes, power shortages, and outages. Uh, then about user empowerment, like labeling skills or uh, different methods or best practices regarding uh, how users can be informed or how users can be uh, can have an active role in developing or, or using the, the devices. Then about IoT security standards uh, out there, how to adapt the, these recommended best practices. And finally, about the security updates with warranty policies and different things that, that are really important. So we have analyzed uh, 30 documents from uh, more than 400 best uh, good practices found in these uh, regulatory or policy documents called, uh, of practices. Around the world here you have like the average picture of different documents uh, per country, uh, talking about different uh, four policy areas that we identify in the research. Uh, we identify these four pillars of IoT security that are data privacy and confidentiality, secure updating, user empowerment, as I mentioned in, in some of the policy questions. So these areas came from the policy questions, and then operational resilience. This is just like, you know, the, the, they say that a picture is worth a, a thousand words. This is a picture where, where the countries uh, are uh, from our study. Uh, not so much, and you can see a proliferation in the global north. That is the most important part. So here is the most important, and I think I, I am plenty with time here. So the main conclusions from the research are the importance of collaboration, really central defining its vital role of joint efforts in bolstering the IoT security. We have found these documents from prominent regions uh, advocating for multi-stakeholder involvement, highlighting the need for precise delineation of roles across the spectrum uh, from the makers, um, you know, like uh, the manufacturers uh, to the users. Then there are st specific stakeholder policies like discernible approach for crafting these policies targeting distinct stakeholder groups, uh, they roll out and uh, how to do the application. So a standout example is the Korean policy, for example, which bridges regulatory directives with practical guidance for each developer. Uh, intrinsic device security, for example, this uh, anonymous uh, push exists for de developing these IoT devices that inherently prioritize security. This encompasses crafting devices resilient to common advertise uh, ad adversities and preempting cyber threats, notable denial of service attacks, uh, with emphasis on, on this fault tolerance. Then the focus on the user involvement and threat management, you know, this sizable portion of the literature emphasizes the need for proactive vulnerability disclosure policies. Uh, and this systematic response to the IoT threats is central to promote user awareness here, transparency and international cooperation, all converging to elevate the, the IoT security to the next level. And to ensure uh, ad adherence to the IoT security norms, these strategies for standard compliance is a mix of regulatory directives, uh, incentives, and labeling systems sometimes uh, are utilized. Yet the success of these me mechanisms varies uh, depending on the regional specificities. Uh, another one is the warranty tied to security. You know, uh, there is a clear trend linked uh, the duration of the device warranties with the commitment to ongoing security updates. Also, regions like the European Union are uh, led in this, as in this aspect, uh, but a uniform global implementation I is lacking. So finally, the need for global standard unification, despite a plethora of best practices that are available, uh, as we mentioned, there is a significant gap uh, in aligning with universally recognized uh, security standards, like, for example, the one suggested by the IETF. Uh, this accentuates the pressing need for a co more coordinated strategy to tackle the IoT security at the global level. So what are our recommendations from the research? Uh, regarding accountability and developer-centric regulatory language, uh, there is a clear need to delineate responsibility across the different stakeholders, uh, as I say, from the developer, the manufacturers to the users. 
then to adopt an approach uh, as seen in the Korean policy document, providing practical examples, protocol schemes, code snippets, and device illustrations for uh, for every stakeholder to, to know uh, what are the implications there. Uh, this will bridge the gap between the policy language and the actionable steps for the developers. Another recommendation is recognize the developer as vital stakeholders, translating these regulatory directives into practical guidelines for robust IoT security implementation. About um, unauthenticated vulnerabilities, the analysis of service attacks, uh, brute force attacks, there is a need to prioritize countermeasures for the, these attacks, uh, which exploit vulnerabilities without requiring authentication sometimes. Um, the issue of embedded security measures within IoT devices, recognizing that there are some constraints there, and regulatory efforts uh, should concentrate or uh, on tailoring defenses against these unauthenticated threats. This is a common thing <laughs> in every device. Uh, about coordinated vulnerability disclosures, uh, promote the CVD as a cooperating uh, strategy involving researchers, manufacturers, and also the users. Uh, also using this vulnerability disclosure to detect, verify, and remedy vulnerabilities I in a more coordinated manner. Uh, policymakers should incentivize this adoption of uh, vulnerability disclosure mechanisms, enhancing the overall of the IoT security through collective efforts. The on the open standards part, it's important to emphasize on open standards, uh, like those uh, made by the IETF or, or other standardizing companies, uh, in enhancing the, the IoT device security. Uh, such standards are promoting transparency, collaboration, and sometimes interoperability. Uh, so it could be good to, to have those to, to, to a robust defense against the security pitfalls we are talking about. Uh, policymakers should also leverage uh, and actively participate in the standard setting forums. Sometimes we have found that uh, there is no mention in these policy documents about the IOTF standards, so uh, we will be great to, to encourage a global adoption of secure protocols and, and architectures. Uh, finally, on the secure updates and warranty policies integration, we have found and recommend that integrating security updates directly with the warranty policies uh, will ensure prolonged device security and functionality. Recognizing these uh, potential risks of outdated or unpatched devices is really important. So advocating also for the manufacturers to maintain these regular updates, ensuring the products are remain secure and efficient throughout all the, the lifespan of the device and also encourage a, a proactive stance against potential security vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, embedding the notion of security within the device, uh, warranty framework is, is something that is desired. So this is in a nutshell or wha what we have to say about the working group one research on IoT security by design. Um, maybe uh, at the end, if you have some questions, we, we will address it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Niklas. And one of the other authors is sitting here in the front, Joao Foucault. So also welcome in, in the room. Um, as you heard, there are major challenges concerned IoT security, and a lot of them involved with not implementing existing standards and security measures that are out there sometimes for decades and has to be u have to be used more often. What is a way to actually could lead to deployment of these standards. And that is our other working group that was led by Mallory Nodal and Liz Orembo, who did the, ma the major research part. Both of them are on a plane at this moment towards Osaka, so they're not in this room. And I have been asked to give the presentation in their, uh, in their stead. Um, the working group is called Procurement and Supply Chain Management and the Business Case. And why the business case? the business case for deployments does not seem to be there for the simple reason that there's no level playing field. If I would be a company and would deploy all these standards, that would cost me effort, money, time, etc., and pro probably higher prices. If all my competitors do not deploy, it means that I'm too expensive. So there's no incentive to deploy because there's no demand. And so there's no d d supply for more secure ICT. What is a way to change that? And that is what we studied. We looked at procurement documents in the world, looking at the fact whether they took in security as a whole, and from there, they looked at cybersecurity. And next, whether they 
discuss internet standards or ICT best practices in that procurement documents. We make one caveat because for the simple reason we could only study what we could find online. So what is not there, you can't study. What we try to do is ask the communities, does your company have a procurement document? And if so, are you willing to share that with us? From the government side, we got several, and people even helping us with the translation, so that was very kind. But from the industry side, we didn't get anything. So does it mean it's secret? Does it mean it is not there? We simply do not know because we did not receive any response. So what from there, th the plan two years ago that was made by Mallory is to th three stages. First is to go through the objective, to, to, to set the scoping, from there do the actual research which was done by Liz, and then come up with this, this report. And hopefully in the, in the next year, a, a second phase to this report so that the guidance actually reaches government and industry. So what they looked at first is terminology. They looked at what they thought uh, what is procurement, that's the context of digital technologies, is refers to the process of acquiring goods, services, or solutions from external sources to meet the needs and requirements of an organization. And security standards are critical in the procurement of digital technologies due to the increasing importance of protecting sensitive information systems and networks from cyber threats. So the methodology already explained the three stages that they went through, and what they looked at is what they looked at is common elements of best practice. They looked at whether there are shared problem barriers, and they looked at the global north and the global south, because in the end, it works the same for everybody, nobody, where, no matter where you live. So, what did they find? They used a methodology used by the National Institute of Standards and Technology from the United States, and they have five core cybersecurity functions that they identified in there and, and promote. The first is to identify, then to protect, to detect, respond, and recover, and they looked at whether that fitted that, that mold. But the conclusions are a bit devastating, to be honest. In all the documents that we found is that there is if there's something on security, it is hardly ever on cybersecurity, so let alone demanding internet standards that would make the products that you buy more secure and safer. So everybody buys sort of on off the shelf or forced by industry to buy what they offer. And especially in the global south, that is the case that we often hear. It's either this or you don't get anything. So that's the choice that you are supposed to make. So what did they come up with best practices? She decided, Mal Mallory decided to give best practice awards. And yes, I'm Dutch, so sorry to be looking a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, like it. I'm biased here, but I'm <laughs> I did not write this, remember that. First is the GDPR and the European Union, the, uh, the, the privacy regulation. So this is not an internet standard in itself but what it is, it has become a global standard that leads to the implementation of several of these standards because they have to adhere to privacy regulation. And the GDPR has become in the past years a standard for the rest of the world that's being copied. Then we get to the Dutch side of things. The Netherlands Ministry of the Interior and, the Interior and Kingdom Relations has published, I think about six years ago, a mandatory list for governments, no matter what level of government. If you de uh, procure ICTs, you have to demand, I think it's 43 open standards. And that leads to the fact that these governments have to either comply or they have to literally explain why they do not adhere to this list. And that re report is sent to the Dutch parliament each year. So in other words, that is a driving force toward industry. And does this work? Yes, because even Microsoft is being slowly forced to deploy DNSSEC, for example. And now, next level, they could have to deploy a standard called Dane. And I won't explain what it is. Maybe I need, can't even do it totally properly. But the fact is that even a big company like Microsoft is being pushed towards this mold. 
And the third award is going to an initiative called internet.nl. And if you go to, a web to that website, internet.nl, and you type in the domain name, the, the URL of any company that you think, I'd like to check that, that if you score 100%, then there's a lady walking around here and she gives t-shirts away <laughs> if you get the 100%. So, so in other words, the, 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 that is a tool that you can check, is the company I deal with secure? So check your bank, for example, and you will probably be very disappointed. This tool is open source and can be copied by uh, anybody who li likes, and uh, making it up in your own language. So for example, is Australia, Brazil, Denmark, Singapore, and Portugal have done so already. Well, the future work is how can we make use of these findings and then start translating them into the next phase. And that is something that we will be discussing here and with others in the near future because we have to make sure that this is not just a digital piece of paper on a fairly obscure website called the Internet Governance Forum. This is a message that has to go out there because governments and industry, when they start demanding these levels of security from their suppliers, or from their devices or from their service provider, they can only change or be out of business. So that is an extremely strong force for more cybersecurity, and we should be starting to use that. So that ends my presentation on behalf of Mallory and Liz, and if there are any questions, we can go there at the, uh, at the end of, uh, of the session. Um, as Louise is not presenting. I think that Janice, you're up next uh, because we've been talking about this future and we had a big session on uh, day zero on the cybersecurity hub led by Janice. And she will share with you the ideas that we have to, to go forward with this work, but first with education and skills because I have to explain that Janice was the first to come with a report last year in Addis Ababa. And now we're going to hopefully take that to the next level, Janice. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Education and skills. Well, cybersecurity involves everyone, and we began with a few questions. When we began three years ago, I think it's best that I take you back there so you see why we're moving forward in the way we are. Question one, is there a gap between supply and demand? That is to say, between the young graduates who come out and the skills they have looking for a job in the cybersecurity industry and the young people that the cybersecurity industry is looking for. And the conclusion in a report, uh, in a survey done in 66 countries, was yes, there is definitely a gap. Whereas industry is looking for young people who understand how internet works, how the cloud works, and therefore can adapt with the emerging technology, universities and the tertiary education system are putting out young people who know all about coding, who are good communicators, but, and also who understand the ethical challenges on the other hand, according to industry, 67% of them simply don't have the soft transversal skills that enable them to adapt to the future. From there, now that we see that there is really something to do, we've decided how do we go about it? And the future seems to be a cybersecurity hub where we bring together industry, where we bring together universities, but also we cater to the cybersecurity challenges of firemen, for example, who would think that they have enormous cybersecurity challenges. Farmers, almost anyone. So what would this hub do? First of all, yeah, it would coordinate. It would implement, uh, it, it would encourage more collaboration, but it would drive for diversity. Look around you, how many women are in this room? 
because, and how many women are here on the platform. This is pretty indicative of one of the big problems that the cybersecurity industry is suffering. This lack of diversity, lack of young people, lack of women, lack of the granular approach, the more granular approach that women can bring to the issue. Another area where the hub would, I think, be very instrumental, would be providing authentic learning resources to universities so that universities in the tertiary sector are actually helping young people learn the way it's necessary for their future. Cybersecurity industry, as we all know, have decided that it's better to take young graduates out of school, secondary school, and to train them in their own way. And that way, they have uh, key in hand young people who are ready to do what they want. But these young people are blocked in a way. They don't have the underlying skills. And so one of our very big objectives is to ensure that we are educating for the future, we are educating to enable young people to adapt to the real needs. It's also to gather good practice. In Denmark, for example, something like the hub already exists. And it's really created a much faster moving industry. Europol has pointed out that cyber attacks are multiplying by 20% every year, yet the allocation of resources, be it human or financial, is only increasing at 10% per year. So we can see that we're losing the battle. The Cyber Hub aims to really put what we've learned into practice, bring the right people around the table, continue this collaboration so that education and skills are really responding to the challenge. But there is one thing further. You cannot suddenly understand internet, understand the cloud, if as a child you don't learn how things function. So there is a need for a fundamental change in education systems so that young people right from the beginning are not just using the tool, but they are understanding what they're using. And I think you can see how broad this, the, the impact of this could be. So we believe that if we have such a hub, we can also advise all of those education ministries who are very eager to know how do we help young people be safer and be more secure online. So I think the hub is the point where all of this will meet. Thanks, Wow. Thank you, Janice. Um, this is a concept. It's not that the hub is there, but we're discussing how we're going to organize this, uh, where we're going to organize this, and hopefully that will be within the IGF to produce more tangible outcomes in the future. Um, it's time now for an official moment, because as you heard, we had the presentations on the reports, but at this moment, they're going to come online. So I'm going to ask Abraham Selby, who is in London in a horrible time, middle of the night, to share his screen and to show the QR code. Hello, uh, hello, Selby. Um, yes, please, Ruth. Um, let me um, um, share the um, QR code to the general. Um, okay, let me cut. So if you like to report, then all you have to do is uh, put your cell phone on the, at the QR code and you can download the two reports immediately. So the first one on IoT and the second one on procurement. Okay. So um, this is the, um, how do you call it? The, the main page you can be able to scan and um, get all our reports um, on our website. We have all the resource reports that um, they all talked about. So all the reports are 
um, there on our website. But like after our presentation, we will be able to come and also share the link to our report in the chat as well. I think Nicholas has shared some website link to in the chat. So um, we are ready to go on that. Okay. Th thank you very much, Shelby, for the, the effort of, of getting all this together. Uh, gra greatly appreciated by, by us all. Thank you. And we'll okay, come back right, to you later you. with the S SDG uh, report. Okay, all right. So this is a little less official than last year when we could uh, hand over a printed report to uh, to Paul Mitchell, but this, uh, I think, is a very more modern way to, to do it, and it will be on the IGF website as well pretty soon so that everybody can, uh, can read it. Um, so that is where we are today, but what is it what we want to do in the near future? So there are three working groups that are uh, two of our up and running, but working towards a new result. And the third one is hoping to start in 2024. So the first that I would like to give the word is online. That is Stephen Tan, and he's working for the Cybersecurity Agency in Singapore. And he's one of the, 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 the experts in the advisory panel of Working Group 8, working on a tool of inter uh, internet standards. So Stephen, the, the please come online and, um, and show us what, what it is exactly that Working Group 5 is striving to do. Hi, hi. Good, good morning, esteemed colleagues and attendees at the IGF in Kyoto. Yeah, so I'm Stephen, and glad to join you virtually today as a representative of Working Group 5, in short, WG5. So WG5 works involves uh, navigating the complexity of internet standards and best practices with a dedicated focus on facilitating governments and organizations in making secure and informed ICT procurement decisions. So basically, at the heart of our efforts lies the list, as mentioned by uh, Walt earlier. It's not a mere checklist, but we see it as a guiding compass, a result of collective expertise and foresight. The conception of the list came from a pressing need. Basically, how can we assist decision makers and procurement officers to effectively navigate through a myriad of standards without being overwhelmed, and importantly, ensure that security is deeply embedded in their decisions. Our answer to this itself is articulated across four foundational principles that we have came up with. First, interoperability. Second, robust security. Third, it must be open and publicly available for use. And last but not least, a proven ecosystem-wide readiness and implementation. This would allow entities out there to build digital ecosystems that are not only robust and secure, but also transparently and eff efficaciously deployable. These principles have allowed us to discern four core domains, namely data protection and privacy, network and infrastructure security, website and web application security, and of course, communication security. Deriving from these standards include standards such as DNSSEC, which Walt has mentioned earlier on as well, that helps to safeguard against unauthorized DNS alterations. And of course, DMARC, uh, which we are, not, we, are, we are still seeing a very low adoption at this point in time, that actually helps to prevent email spoofing, phishing, as well as scams by verifying sender on CTC. Meanwhile, it's worth noting that while cloud computing permits numerous aspects of the digital sphere, it has not been singled out as a standalone domain in our framework. Our intention herein is to imbue an adaptive and an all-encompassing perspective towards standards, ensuring that they are all equally applicable and resilient in cloud environments and beyond. Now, you may be wondering why is this list so crucial then? I think at this point in time, we in this era where we have noticed that first mover disadvantages are evident and essential standards often remain shrouded or under the hood, there's an inherent need for transparency and collective action between countries globally. Products and services without the right guidance can inevitably leave users vulnerable. Through this list, WG5 seeks to catalyze a global shift towards security by design. It is our conviction that such a guiding framework can empower decision makers, especially during procurement, to advocate for and, and ensure foundational security. Last but not least, acknowledging the merit of collective intelligence, we warmly invite cyber and ICT experts worldwide to critique, reflect upon, 
and propose enhancement to our framework. Your insights aligned with our guiding principles will be instrumental in refining the list, ensuring it remains dynamic, relevant, and globally applicable. We will also like want to take this opportunity to acknowledge several global initiatives vital in putting the standards we advocate into operation. I think both have mentioned them, but I'll just name them again. This includes some of the notable endeavors such as internet.nl by the Dutch government, the internet hygiene portal spearheaded by the Singapore government, and WebCheck PT developed by the Portugal, Portugal government in collaboration with its registry. These initiatives not only validate but also help to amplify the applicability and impact of these standards in tangible real-world scenarios, underscoring their crucial role in augmenting cybersecurity and compliance. In wrapping up this portion, we proffer the list not as an end, but really as a starting point. And together, let's navigate through the complexities of the digital realm, ensuring a secure, reliable, and inclusive internet for all. The consultation will, start, will run from today until 5th November, 12 p.m. UTC. With that, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. I think that it's quite clear that what the goal of the working group is, but also an invitation to work with us in this consultation. As uh, a dynamic coalition, we can't produce a report or a tool without consulting the broader IGF community and beyond. And that is something that we've done on all our reports so far, and we will do on this tool as well. So as of now, the consultation is open. You can go to our website, IS3C, I'm sorry, IS3Coalition.org. And if you go there, you find the link to the Google Doc where you can share your thoughts on this list, whether you agree with the scope that we made, whether you agree with the content and agree with the standards themselves. So if you go got arguments to change it, then we will take that into consideration. We expect to be working on it in the second half of November and hopefully produce the final tool somewhere in December or very early in January. So that is the, 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 time, sc the time scale that we're opera operating on. And as Stephen said, we see it as a start because it will well be possible that we do this for health or for agriculture in the future as well, but we will see whether that is feasible or not. You can see the QR code. I think there's also a QR code for the for the the, the consultation. The second working group that is up and running since spring and is now in the process of, of starting an advisory panel of experts on this topic is the working group eight on DNSSEC and RPKI deployment. Why these two well, our sponsors are ICANN and RIPE NCC, so that makes it more logical to look at the domain name system and at the routing system, but also that what we're going to do is provide a blueprint that will, in the end, uh, work for all internet standards and all organizations. But I won't sell, say anything more because otherwise David doesn't have anything left to say, so I'll give the hand to, to the, the microphone to David Huberman to please explain to us what Working Group 8 is going to do in this year and early next year. Thank you very much, Wow. <coughs> so the internet's kind of cool. The internet's kind of cool because it works no matter how you access it. A lot of you are holding iPhones right now. A lot of you are holding Android devices. The internet works the same way on both of those devices. It works on your Mac laptops and your PC laptops and your desktop computers and your smart devices. Whatever you have, it works. But if you look in the scope of human history, that's different. It doesn't normally work like that. We're here in Kyoto, and if you go walk outside, you'll see vehicles on the road. And you know what? They're driving on the left side of the road. And those vehicles have their steering wheels on the right side of the cars. But if we just go across the sea to South Korea to our west, they're driving on the right side of the road with the steering wheels on the left side of the car. And that means <coughs> we've set two different sets of standards for safety, for operation, and for the manufacture of vehicles. For those of us who are visiting this beautiful country, you know what we all have in common right now? We've all brought these little travel adapters because we when we want to charge our phones, we want to charge our devices, it's a different standard here 
than it is in a different country or where we're from. There are about five different standards for the shape of plugs and for the voltage of plugs. And yet the purpose of a plug is the same thing. It's to provide power. If you open, if you open up my wallet right now, you'll find Japanese yen, euros, and American dollars. And that's kind of silly because the purpose of money in 2023, the purpose of currency, it's the same thing everywhere in the world you go. It's so I can go buy something. The, the, I can give you countless examples of the way we've standardized many different ways all around the world. But the internet is the exception. Starting in 1969, when four engineers built the first internet standard, there was some software on how the earliest internet router would work, through today in 2023, we're about to publish the 10,000th internet standard. We've developed a system of standards that all engineers who work on internet connected networks have adopted. We haven't adopted all of those 10,000 standards, but we've chosen the ones that work the best to build a network that works for everybody in the world. And of those standards, there are two that serve as the building block for all internet in the world. All the services you use, TikTok, YouTube, your, an application to, to do your banking, to make your plane reservations, they all rely on two protocols. BGP, which is used for routing, so that all the networks in the world can talk to each other in a common language, and DNS. DNS allows us to scale the internet beyond the ability of just IP addresses. It's the IP addresses that computers use to talk to one another but there aren't enough IP addresses for the computers to use. So we're able to communicate via domain names. We're able to give host names to devices. BGP and DNS are old. BGP was standardized now in 1995. That was almost 30 years ago. And DNS is older than that. DNS next month is gonna celebrate its 40th birthday. And when we built these standards, we built them to work. What we didn't do is we didn't build them to give security. So over the years, we've seen security is actually very much, is just as important as reachability and, oper and interoperability. So, we've both, so the IETF has bolted on security standards to run in DNS and to run in BGP. And the two most important standards are DNSSEC and RPKI for routing. DNSSEC is 23 years old. And our deployment level is, I mean, Andrew, you can, you can quibble with me on the numbers here, but globally it's about 15 to 20% at the max. That's not very good for a security standard that everybody in the world needs to adopt to make the internet safer. RPKI is doing a little bit better. RPKI in some nations is 50, 60, 70, 80%, but in some nations it's 25%. In Africa, it's right around 25%. So working group eight, is trying to develop a new narrative to convince policymakers and to convince decision makers that you have to adopt DNSSEC and you have to adopt RPKI as a basic standard in everything you do. And that's what Working Group 8 is working on today. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Yes, thank you, David. I think this message comes across quite clearly that for some reason these standards are around for a long long time and they are not being used and that exposes everybody to vulnerabilities that allows the dark side to attack the internet 24 hours a day and they do as we all know with all the incidents that we read about almost on a daily basis so the adoption of these standards would actually make us all more secure and safer. And that's uh, you can see how all these working groups tie into each other because they all come up with the same message. Why are governments and industries not deploying these standards? And try and change the narrative from a technical point of view that may not convince a CEO or a, a director general at a, at, a, at a ministry to a, a narrative that he can understand and actually get, get a positive decision from. So that is a also a sort of tool that we are going to develop that will also be consulted as soon as the text is ready and you can share your ideas with us and then somewhere in the early in the next year we will probably be able to pr produce the tool and share it with you. 
The final working group that we have at this point in time, and I have to say that if anybody has an idea to start a new working group within IS3C, you can always contact either Mark or me to discuss that. But at this moment, the last person that approached us was Elif uh, Cortez Gizo, who is not here in Kyoto, but maybe online. But we agreed that the vice chair, Martin Bottelman, of our Emerging Technologies Working Group would give the presentation. So hand over the microphone to you if you have your own mic. Yes. I know people online can hear me as well. So thank you, Wout, for that. And uh, thanks, Elif, uh, for for asking me to speak. Uh, actually, I'm assisting uh, Elif because I believe governance of emerging technologies is, is key. And thinking ahead of what's coming towards us is something we should uh, try to do today rather than wait until it's too late. Now, the two emerging com uh, technologies that are mentioned uh, explicitly is quantum technologies and AI. Uh, for AI, we're already almost running behind the, the wagon because it's all over the place, it's discussed everywhere. Quantum is still particularly in the more technical circles, I would say today. Uh, nevertheless, both subjects do reserve, uh, uh, d deserve our attention and deserve to have that now. So. The working group uh, of uh, IS3C, uh, working group nine, uh, aims to develop a roadmap for governance strategies for these emerging technologies. And the roadmap will set out the roles of the different players, stakeholders, governance, private sector, civil society stakeholders, and if I may add, the technical community. Uh, and for getting there, uh, the aim is to, to learn from what's happening there and, 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 and look ahead. So the particular goals of the working group are to raise awareness of the security and safety issues, as IS3C's focus is, on these relevant uh, 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 technologies and policy decisions related to it. Next to it, it's, it's also to investigate the emergent issues and, and make sure we're up to date on uh, what keeps uh, stakeholders busy or should keep stakeholders busy uh, with inputs from public and private sector, technical community and civil society. And certainly then ultimately to come to develop policy recommendations as we've done in the previously presented uh, reports. Uh, and guidelines uh, as IGF outcomes, so, so really also subject to a consultation with the people at the IGF, in the IGF circles. So right now, the aim is to, to, to really get the project organized. And uh, once we have it up and running, I'm sure it will be announced on the website. And uh, uh, the, the current thinking is that we would uh, first focus on mapping the current risks and opportunities. That balance needs to be there. We're not just focusing on the risks because it's also about the need to deploy these uh, new technologies and, and, and how to benefit best from them. Um, and the aimed at the quantum and AI the second is uh, publication of a comparative report of existing frameworks around the world. And uh, some of us may be aware of the European Union's AI Act discussions, uh, the proposed uh, algorithmic, algorithmic Accountability Act in the United States, and, and no doubt there's others. So uh, I've been uh, privy to the, the, the IoT security report and uh, the comparison of over 40 countries with so many reports is something that is, is truly helpful to understand where policy making stands in the world. Uh, uh, and I look forward to have a similar uh, inventory for, for, for quantum and AI as well that uh, makes us real. Now, one of the things that uh, Nicholas was sharing is that uh, a lot is happening and it's not coordinated that well yet. Uh, so I think IS3C, uh, IS3C and the working group specifically uh, would be able uh, to, to fulfill a specific role in helping to make people more aware and in that way also uh, help towards uh, standardization and global collaboration 
on subjects that are truly global from, uh, from nature, even if it's also in the specific interest of, of national governments and, and stakeholders. Uh, but they cannot develop any standards effectively within isolation. Something is breaking down. Something was breaking down. <laughs> I hope it wasn't me. Uh, at least the people in the room, I think, understood me well. If there's questions online, please uh, use the chat because our online moderator is, is, is keeping an eye on that. And uh, with that, back to you, Wout. Yes, thank you, Martin. And uh, there's also a new, a new working group that hopefully will start working in 2024, and we're having our first discussions with potential funders pretty soon. Um, that before I open the floor to you, there's one more person who's going to present, because as I said when we started, that uh, ISVC does not want to do this work in isolation. So how have we contributed to the Global Digital Compact, uh, had, had presentations in the deep dives, but also how are we holding up with the Sustainable Development Goals? So, Selby, you are in London, and uh, again, I ask you to come online and uh, present to us what you, what you have found and where you think what we can actually completely match. And if you would like to share your presentation, share your screen, please. Okay, all right. Um, thank you very much, Wood. Um, so, basically, um, looking at um, IS3C, um, what all the working groups are presenting, um, we have been um, working in so um, um, deeply to um, address the um, um, processes in terms of the sustainable development goals. So, um, um, to present um, the IS3C, our contribution to sustainable development goals, because all these things that we are doing, uh, we are looking at how sustainable it is, how does it align with the UN um, SDG goals. Um, so um, when we look at the, um, the 17 SDG goals, as we all know, um, this, uh, we are working to, towards this. And this is our guidelines in terms of the um, work IS3C is doing. Um, as you see, um, we all know about IS3C, uh, which um, like uh, we are working collaboratively to um, make the internet more um, um, safer and also put the best practices around the internet. We have this objective that we are working on under the SDG goals, um, which um, includes the, um, promoting a secure and resilient internet infrastructure, which also supports um, su sustainable development. And also, we also want to create um, a greater awareness um, of the importance of de deploying existing global internet standards, which en enhances online security and data and um, privacy protection as well. We also want to support international cooperation and um, also collaborate to address the internet challenges that's hindering the achievement of SDG goals. Now, um, we will look at some um, of the relevant work that we are doing as um, Janice, Nicholas, um, and Wood and um, Sam and other uh, um, people are presenting and also our future work and how it can contribute to SDG goals. Um, we are looking at some three thematic areas um, whereby we um, are working towards good health and well-being. Um, like this um, has, has been another goal for some of the working groups and we'll be highlighting more because of time. And we have a full document to share on our website that you can have a details for our work. Um, this um, also includes the decent of work and economic goal because IS3C believes that um, our work um, should be very decent and it also has to promote the growth of economy. Internet standard also help in terms of as we are all moving digital aspect of the world, we are trying to create employment opportunities. So when we have all these um, um, working policies, working standards within our, our section, it can also help to create a decent work and economy, which are also aligned to the SDG goal eight as well. We also have industry innovation and infrastructure because as um, um, we know, ICANN has partnered with the DNS security then another um, IOT, then other quantum um, technologies. We know that the emerging technology AIs, these are all industry innovations, which is helping work to become um, easier. So UN also um, um, admits that we must able to make sure that the SDG goals, we must create an 
innovation and infrastructure and industry experience that will help us um, all to live within um, the globe as well. Now let's see um, some of the working areas and the working groups. Um, we can see that um, the working group one, security by design, which um, focuses on the good health well-being, um, SDG 9 industry innovation, SDG 11, that's the sustainable cities and communities. When we um, get all the reports basically on um, security by design, we'll be able to um, understand and um, um, get a concept based on what working group one is trying to achieve and what they have done and what in the future, how it all contributes to the SDG goals. We have working group two, the education and schools by Janice group, which they are contributing to so many aspects of the um, SDG goals, meaning that they are focused on the SDG one, SDG four, SDG five, SDG 10, um, the quality education, and um, um, also creating an impact within the industry innovation and other um, um, good health as well. When we also look at the working group three, that's the procurement supply chain where um, Wood was talking about. We are um, focusing our work to relevant the SDG three and SDG nine, which um, indirectly we are also contributing as part of the um, SDG 16 because it's, it's a, a work focus that we, we want to partner um, institutions to work towards, the, to make sure that the internet standard are sustainable. And we also have working group five, which they are prioritizing the listing and security related of internet standard and ICT best practices. And their um, outcome um, is achieving to contribute to the SDG3, SDG9, and which is also our main focus goal for the sustainable development goals. And there we have the working group six, which is um, data governance. And they um, uh, have more work focus um, in terms of the SDG3, that is the creating more secure and safer, trustworthy global online environment. So they um, want to support in, in terms of the governance aspect, how can we sustain it? And this all aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we have working group eight, the DNS second and RK, RPKI deployment, which also works in terms with them, making sure that we align our focus based on the um, SDG3, we align on um, SDG 8 and SDG 9 regarding sustainable development group and economic group. We're also concerned about um, um, sustainable, innovative, and industrialization as um, we were um, discussing um, um, sooner. And we also look at the uh, working group 9, which will be starting um, in, the con um, in the coming year where uh, we have that our working policies should be able to target to um, the UN Sustainable Goals, um, which um, focuses on the SDG 3, SDG 8, SDG 9, ensuring that the global infrastructure for this um, transformative technologies is secured. And um, it, it's, it's supposed to be something that, which is sustainable. And um, at the end of the day, all the work that we are doing um, are combined as an IS3C group. And uh, we um, hope to get more input about um, other areas that we can um, collaborative work to um, and make sure that um, our work is very focused to um, um, the UN agenda um, 2030. Thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate the um, um, short while um, for giving me um, the time to um, speak about our work and that. And we have also contributed to uh, the Global Digital Compact as well with um, Dr. Um, Alison uh, Wild, where um, these are all um, processes that align um, in terms of working to the uh, sustainable development goals. And I really appreciate the um, all test people who help us to um, work together. All the working group leaders helped us. And we also um, appreciate um, Olivier Wood and um, um, Mark as well. Thank you very much um, for this opportunity. And you can um, scan these QR codes to um, um, visit our website, view our report, and, uh, and also um, contact us through um, um, this medium as we um, present this to you. Thank you very much for um, this kind of opportunity today, Woods. Yes, thank you very much, Selby, for this uh, excellent work. And thank you for your presentation and getting up in the middle of the night. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions or comments. But first, I'm going to look if there's anything online. No, nothing. Then who has a question to one of the people who wrote the reports or have a comment or would like to know something more? So there's a microphone, so please step up. And it was all very, very clear. 
Um, Bastian, I'm going to perhaps ask you a question. Why is it so important? In the, David had to leave because of another session, but why is it so important for ICANN and the RIPE NCC to support an initiative like DNSSEC and RPKI deployment? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, and thanks everyone. You know for the uh, the updates and you know the the reports that I look forward to uh, to read. Uh, my name is uh, Bastian Goslings. I'm Dutch. I work for the RIPE NCC. I'm part of their policy team. The RIPE NCC being the regional internet registry for Europe, uh, the Middle East, and the certain parts of uh, Central Asia. And what we basically do at the core is uh, allocate and register certain number resources. IP addresses, uh, used to be IPv4, and now it's IPv6 addresses, as well as autonomous systems number. Those resources are used by networks, uh, they become a member of us in order to get those resources. They are used in order to configure their networks and to interconnect with other networks for the routing to happen. And I think, you know, as um, David very eloquently uh, summarized, you know, and also using some, some nice day-to-day -day examples, both when it comes to the DNS and on the other hand, the routing part, these are building blocks when it comes to the internet, right? Everything else at the end of the day, all digital services, applications, everything depends on the workings of those functionalities and the protocols that are associated with those. Um, as he also said, the, the protocols underlying those, and if I focus on routing BGP, that's from the previous century, right? So that's 30 years old. And security has not been built into that. It was at the time, you know, created. I think also like the, tec the technical technicalities, the, the equipment, the computers, etc. Of course, was not capable of what uh, modern day equipment is can do. So it was basically meant to work. And everyone, you know, that used, that worked in this community and used this type of equipment and wanted to in interconnect with each other, they knew each other. People trusted each other. So it used, it had to be like uh, an easy to to work with protocol, no overhead and it would just have to work. Well, seeing where we are at now, everything depends on it. Um, for work, leisure, business, even public services, right? It just works, the internet. And you communicate with, you think you will communicate with, you, you reach out to content and consume that, you know, when you think um, you want to do so. But at the end of the day, it depends on these protocols without security being built in. The problem that we have now, um, basically it boils down to the fact that the tools are available, have been available for quite a long time. Adoption is happening, but it's not going fast enough. We need to secure eh, these fundaments that underpin the workings of the internet. For all of us, eh, like we as a regional internet registry, part of our mission is also to facilitate and to enable others to use uh, the, the internet, right? And, and, to, and to, to enable the further development and innovation of it. But before, you know, we make the next steps, we need to fix the fundaments. And I think, you know, we can use this opportunity in a multi-stakeholder context with a different narrative to hopefully attempt, you know, in another way to convince people why this is important. It's not quite as technically complex as people think it is. It's not as expensive as people actually think it is. And it's not only, oh, I'm doing it and I'm helping someone else. No, it's beneficial for yourself, right? If you are an, an online uh, business providing services, you depend on the continuity of service, right? You don't want it to break. You don't want something to go wrong and that affecting your reputation, right? And then, well, whatever comes from that. And the same from a public interest perspective. I think we need to get our act together here. We are willing to contribute here. We think we can do this together, right? With the private sector, with governments, with uh, other stakeholders, right? That have an interest here, whether it's end users, civil society, others, academia. If we don't do it, then there w certainly from the region I come from, I wouldn't be surprised if at a certain point um, legislators are going to say, hey, this doesn't work. We just wait for another big incident and they're going to regulate it. And that might have un unintended consequences. So I think we can do it ourselves. Everything is available. The knowledge is there. The experiences are there. We just need to change the narrative. And that's what we look forward to use this uh, working group for. I hope that answers your question, uh, Rod. Yes, uh, thank you, Bastian. Um, I think I've... Like to respond or no different huh? question. A different question. I, I have a different yeah. question. I have a different question. 
thanks for that. By the way, you, you have a session uh, shortly, right, on RPKI focused as well. Yeah. At what time? Call of us week. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas, th thanks for uh, and and Joao, well, thanks for 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 the work done with the research on uh, IoT security. My interest for that was also because I'm also chairman of the Dynamic Coalition for IoT. Uh, so, uh, having seen this report, what are the plans for for next steps? Uh, we haven't talked about that, but I think that work is not done, right? May I respond first, and then show how you will have an opportunity. Uh, yes, th there are several new policy uh, mentioning on, on IoT security. So the idea is to continue the, the report, analyzing the new documents that emerged in 2022 and 2023, and incorporate the new conclusions uh, and recommendations in the same basis. I, I think that is the, the next steps. And we also have the idea of promoting more uh, awareness campaigns, also tutorials more directed maybe to policy makers to, to make sure that they are aware o on, on, on what to do regarding adopting these uh, standards. Uh, so that, that are some of the next steps we, we have concluded in our research. Maybe, Joao, you want to add some of the next steps? Hello, uh, thank you. Well, uh, the uh, straight through uh, next step is to try to create a uh, framework to uh, provide uh, governments and organizations that want to create their best practices, their uh, policy documents related to IoT security. Because now that we have like the, a broad uh, understanding of the, uh, what is good and what not in uh, IoT security, we can uh, go further and try to improve to create new policy documents related to the same subject. Thank you, Joao, and I'm going to ask you another question, because you actually was one of the three researchers doing the work and then helped with writing the report. What was the most surprising thing that came up in the research you've done? What said, how is it possible? Okay, uh, thank you. Well, when we uh, looked up all the documents, one thing that came into our mind is how difficult it is to tackle this issue because we have a compliance uh, requirement very clear in the documents but we also need to uh, to approach the same uh, requirements to the engineering teams and we saw uh, several documents trying to uh, tackle this issue try to to uh, communicate to both audiences and, uh, well, this is definitely a great uh, difficulty and a great challenge for this kind of regulation. An, an extra comment about that uh, is that the, there are several practices. Just to put some examples, like uh, you need to use a strong passwords in, in your devices. Uh, you need to have a, la a software update that is uh, more uh, continuous. But these things cannot, ca cannot uh, the user cannot take the responsibility of doing this. This needs to be by design. Th th that is the, the main idea. Uh, the, the from the manufacturer, from the services uh, the core, this needs to be assured. Uh, you cannot uh, have the possibility of creating a, a weak password for your device. This needs to be assured by, 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 the, by the manufacturer, right? And the same with, with, with all the several areas we have identified. So in that case, th this will be like granted uh, for for uh, like uh, by design right uh, and i think that this is the the the, the main key issue uh, we we have found also uh, in terms of of engaging more with the standardizing company we are repeating and repeating about this like uh, we haven't found uh, mentioning on on the ietf there are several working groups right now at the ietf uh, uh, software update on the Internet of Things, uh, trust executed environment protocols. These this kind of protocols that are, uh, again, by design in the, in the core of the technology, in the core of the device, uh, are not being uh, seen in, in the policy documents. So that, that are some of the main conclusions as well. Great. Thank you, Joao. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicholas. I think that, uh, Martin, you want to respond? Yeah, please? one, one, one uh, additional question. Uh, 
uh, how can new initiatives reach you and flow into your understanding of this because uh, IoT isn't standing still nor is the regulation around it? Will there be an explicit inventory or will there at least be an openness to uh, receive suggestions or whatever? What, what is the plan? Mm, yes, I think that the we 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 will analyze it. We'll see how how this goes uh, uh, over the next years. I think there will be a uh, some kind of pressure uh, for for doing the things better. And, and uh, yes, th this is uh, how the, the policy makers need to be more involved in, in in the processes for for having these these things emerge uh, in the future. I think that that is the 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 the, que the, the response <laughs> from that. Sorry. Yes, yes. Or, or in case that they are interested in, in know more about uh, wha what are the, the the things that they can do, they can also put in contact with with the IS3C and and see how we can organize some training uh, uh, or, or or several uh, activities we we can do for for more awareness, right, about the, these issues. And I think that that could be definitely important. Uh, uh, maybe to have more. Uh, global uh, view of, of, of these subjects for everyone. Well, uh, now I changed mic because I have a question. <laughs> so, uh, Janice, when you talked about uh, the responsibility and the ethics uh, in the work on, on cybersecurity, I uh, this touched one part of me that uh, is really worried because when I see, well, I work with cybersecurity and when I see uh, the day-to-day -day work, I the what we do resembles a lot with uh, like the right use of force because we use tools, we use uh, really uh, like dangerous uh, pieces of software to test systems and I think uh, the uh, professionals aren't actually prepared to handle this and to uh, contribute and l to understand their piece in society. Because when you keep like uh, it, you c I can see uh, some resemblance with like uh, undercover uh, officers that uh, have to use tools, have to uh, like do things that resemble. Uh, breaking laws and at the end they just go home and expect not to use any of their knowledge to do harm and how this challenge is seen in the education uh, space. Thank you, Yo. If I understand the question correctly, you know, the greatest danger on internet is actually the user himself. And many times, I work a lot with young people, also with uh, university students. Many times, they know the right thing to do, but in fact, they don't do it. One of the concerns that I have, um, security by design, there are always going to be products that don't adopt the security by design. So finally, it goes back to the user himself. We've talked a lot about awareness, but awareness means absolutely nothing if it's not education. You can be aware of something, but if you don't incorporate it, um, advocate it to other people, then it's not actually a part of you and you're not practicing it. And I think this is what you're saying. You know, but you go home and do something different. And why is it? It's because we don't understand the impact of what we're doing because it's a little bit like when you drive a car. My father always insisted, if you get your driver's license, you cannot drive until you know how to change a spark plug, but I don't know if they exist anymore, and how to change a tire. Unfortunately, this is just not happening now. We don't understand that we may, yeah, I was surprised that organizations, cybersecurity organizations say the young graduates who come to them have a good ethical understanding. An ethical understanding is no good 
if you don't understand how things work and where you can apply those <coughs> ethics. I'd also like to add another point. It, it's not as gloomy as what I say because a lot of cybersecurity experts who are working in industry are actually also university lecturers. They're also the ones who one day a week or a few hours a week are actually um, giving these courses, but then they're blocked because they're forced to follow a curriculum. They don't have the resources. The resources are too expensive for them to get their hands on, and therefore, although they have good intentions, they're also blocked. So I think the question you asked was very large. I've tried to touch on many areas of it, but it's a very vast thing. We keep hearing about awareness. Awareness is absolutely nothing if it doesn't become firmly ingrained and if it is not education. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Okay, uh, can I go further in one of the aspects that I touched in my question? Great. Well, uh, Janice, one of the things that uh, burden me burdens me is that we are training the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. And these people will have a very specific knowledge and actually you can uh, consider also a very dangerous knowledge because uh, as I worked in the past years, we learned and executed several uh, security testings. So I could, uh, I literally hacked systems to check if they were vulnerable or not. And to me, this is actually uh, an also uh, learning uh, challenge because these people need to understand their role in this, uh, this security space because uh, what I learned, what uh, people that work with me learned is actually quite dangerous if you use in the wrong way. So how can we tackle this issue? So what you're saying is knowledge is power and this is never more true than in the cybersecurity sector. But this knowledge has to come with the value. At the Council of Europe, we say that there are four areas of competences and they must all be taught together. There are values, attitudes, skills, and knowledge and critical understanding. I suppose, seeing what you're doing now, that you got these values at the ta same time as you got the knowledge. And this is what we as educators have to strive to do. Yes, there is always this bad apple who is going to use it and going to, to turn the things around. And this is where your standards come in. This is where the products must be, uh, not, uh, uh, must be less vulnerable to hackers, but also turn the thing around the other way. No one is more powerful in cybersecurity than a converted hacker, or as we call them, ethical hackers. So the knowledge has to come with the values and has to be a full area of knowledge and not just knowing how to do something, but not understanding all the repercussions. Thank you. Thank you, Janice and Joao for the, the question. Um, I think we're going slowly to the wrapping up of this session that I think the message that shines out from all the research is that whether it's on IoT, whether it's on procurement or having to make a list with the most important and urgent uh, internet standards and education and skills, it all shows that we are not working on cyber security in, in a correct way. We're working on mitigation. And in mitigation, there are billions to, to make money on, uh, which is happening on a maybe even a daily basis. But why not move to prevention? And in prevention, that makes sure that some mistakes can't happen anymore. The threats will disappear, not all of them, 
but a lot of them because the opportunity closes. And the technical community has made all these solutions to make that actually happen. So what does it take for industry to actually deploy these measures and these opportunities and these solutions? What everybody is telling us, and also today we heard from Bastian, it may not be a good idea, idea to regulate, because regulate may lead to, as we saw in the policy comparisons, lead to completely different uh, explanations even of, of a, a, a certain word. So how can industry deploy 93 standards of the same topic, perhaps, but what may happen if every country starts inventing the rules themselves. So if they do, it will take a global coordination so that there is an understanding of what we're doing. Also, that innovation may not be hampered, although that is something that I sincerely doubt because I all other industries that are regulated do have innovation. But that is a discussion that we're not having today. But we're trying to prevent regulation. By the simple act, if we can convince our decision makers and decision takers and our procurement officers to start demanding security, just like they demand security when they buy a car. Nobody goes buy a car and drive away and find that the lights are not in there, that the brakes are not working, that there's not even engine in the car, that you have to push it yourself. So in other words, that is something that comes for granted. But why does it come for granted? Because governments did act at some point, saying you need the safety belts, you need the brakes, you need a driver's license, etc. So that is something that in internet, in fact, the technical community is doing for us. So now it's about making sure that the people who lead this world and lead organizations start acting upon it. And then we start moving towards prevention and not only mitigation. Um, this work, uh, this dynamic coalition is now running for three years. So we announced ourselves at the virtual IGF in 2020. In 2021, in Katowice, in Poland, we were able to present our research plans. And in 2022, in others, we had our first report and the serious announcement of work going to happen in this year. Now we are in Kyoto. And as you saw, we, ha we have delivered a lot of reports upcoming tools, new ideas for work. As I said at the beginning, if you have an idea that fits under this dynamic coalition and you think they should start a new working group on, then you can approach us. One of the things that are in the open at this moment, we've tried to start a working group last year on con consumer advocacy. That the funding did not come through, so that's where the person who was leading it uh, stepped out. But what if consumer organizations start testing products with the digital component included? That if that all shows up red, it would mean that consumers get alerted. It will probably make the news if these smart devices are shown as not secure. What about consumer regulators? What is in the laws already today that they can use to say to, to to organizations and to industry, you're not taking care of your, of your customers. So is there an option there to do? So what could we do to make convince these regulators to actually step in and step up their game? What about vulnerable, uh, the, the vulnerability disclosure? As Nicholas said, as a recommendation, what if we could align the world to test everything on the internet 24 seven, just like the bad guys are doing, and make sure that there are protocols around that so that it's all on the white side, and that what comes out is sent to the manufacturer or the developer or the service provider saying, You're not se your product is not secure. Can we have a discussion on that, that, that some sort of a global alignment is agreed upon and then disseminated so that governments can adopt it, that policy? We started with emerging technologies, also an idea that came up. So are there other ideas? I don't know, I'm just saying what is sort of floating at this moment as potential working groups, but could be something totally different. And that can come from any of you. 
I have five minutes left. Mark, I'm going to ask you, you've been on this trip with me from the very beginning. What are your thoughts on the, how we developed and what, what have you seen changed over the past three years? Well, thank you, Wout, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, yes, I've been working with Wout from pretty much the concept stage uh, before we launched the coalition. It seems a long time ago, and uh, there have been many challenges, but we've moved forward uh, incredibly, especially in the last year, with all the research, the incredibly valuable research that's been undertaken by the working groups, as, as you've heard today with um, all our chairs of the working groups' presentations uh, on, on the, their outcomes. And these are tangible outcomes. They are providing us really with a, a resilient platform to go forward. But we need your help. And uh, you know, please follow up with us uh, and spread the word about our objectives, our particular areas of focus, and also, uh, as about described, our open invitation for you to contribute your ideas on what we do next, particularly in the areas of security by design and launching the hub, which um, Janice uh, described in her presentation. There's a lot of good thinking going along in, uh, going on in terms of uh, making that a real, impactful, practical proposition, a hub that brings together key experts in, in industry and in education with outreach to policymakers worldwide um, on, on addressing what is our overall objective, the gaps in deployment of key security standards and, uh, uh, and also routing and also with the, with the work we're undertaking on uh, emerging technologies. Thanks very much. Back to you, Wout. Yes, thank you, Mark. A final question, yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Carlos Vera from uh, IGF Ecuador. Thank you very much for the interesting discussion. I would like to, to remark that uh, not all the time this is only a technical issue. Most of the time, this is a political or economical issue. Maybe the technician are not understanding that this really is political and economic. Technical barrier for political or economical reasons. It's simple, technically, to do very nice uh, things. Also, there is a problem who say what is white or what is black or what is right or what is wrong. In some countries, the legal issues, the good things, they think is bad. Nicaragua, Cuba has the opposite vision that you say Europe. So if the technician doesn't understand how we work for the people that make politics and have the money, we lost the fight, definitely. What do you think? Thank you. Um, thank you. I think you uh, hit the nail on the head here because the, the what we've been trying to say here in IS3C that this is not technical. If the decision is made, it's uh, when as soon as a boss said, within I want this standard to be there, it's there in five minutes probably. Or maybe somebody has to go to a course and then uh, a week later he can deploy it. This is in indeed a political, social, economic, and perhaps e even, even a, a, I don't know, a human rights sort of thing is a, I in a way. So that is why we have Working Group 8 that is going to work on that narrative to move it away from the tec technical side so that uh, the decision maker gets a different choice and not just on the technical basis but based on political or economic or social etc. reasons. That's so thank you for that question and that's what we will try to do. Uh, we are at the final minute, I see it moving to the last minute. Um, I think that you've heard that we've moved a long way, as we said, from, from, a, from an idea to actually putting out reports and showing that the IGF is able to come up with reports that are quite tangible. That's not the reason why we're doing it. They're doing it for the security and to make the world safer and more secure for everyone. Mark already said that you can join us. Uh, you can join us by signing up through the IGF website, if you go to the Dynamic Coalitions uh, and there click on Internet uh, Safety and Security Coalition, you can join the mailing list. 
We won't bombard you with, with uh, all sort of spam. We'll just announce meetings that we organize or announce new working groups. So please join there. We're also always looking for funding. So as you're in a situation that could help one of the research that we're doing, that would be most welcome as well. Because that's the only way that we can make sure that we have professional reports uh, because we can't depend on volunteers only. But volunteer work is definitely welcome. And that's why I want to thank all the chairs here present for their work, because they, pu they it's not Mark and me that are pushing this work, but it's the people who lead the working groups that actually make sure that things happen. And uh, we hope to be able to share the tools with you that next year we're sitting here that we can we heard here was Martin and Elif will come up with, with uh, emerging technologies that we hear what the hub is doing that is, uh, that is being lifted and going forward and that we can actually find ways. And that's, I think, the most important point where I'm going to end with. It must not remain a digital piece of paper on the IGF website. We have to make sure that it translates into actions and that these actions is going to be what makes the world more secure and safe. So with that, I thank everybody who here behind the table presented. Also Stephen in Singapore, but especially Selby in London, where it's, I don't know at this moment, <laughs> it's at four o'clock or something, or three o'clock. So I uh, thank you all. Thank you all for being present, and I hope that, uh, that you've learned what we do, but also that you appreciate what we do. And if you like, join us, and thank you very much for being present.